Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime event on the book Literary Cosmopolitanism in the English fin de siècle, Citizens of Nowhere, written by Dr. Stefano Evangelista. My name is Dr. Maria Blanco and I am the academic champion for networks and partnerships here at Torch. I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Evangelista today to speak about his new book. Also on the panel today are Professor Anita Traninger and Professor Fiona McIntosh, who will be chairing the discussion. The fin de siècle witnessed an extensive and heated debate about cosmopolitanism, which transformed readers' attitudes towards national identity, foreign literatures, translation, and the idea of world literature. Focusing on literature written in English, literary cosmopolitanism in the English fin de siècle offers a critical examination of cosmopolitanism as a distinctive feature of the literary modernity of this important period of transition. The book interrogates cosmopolitanism as a liberal ideology that celebrates human diversity and as a social identity linked to worldliness. It investigates its effect on gender, ethics, and the emotions. It presents the literature of the fin de siècle as a dynamic space of exchange and mediation and argues that our own approach to literary studies could become less national in focus. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Fiona McIntosh, who will fully introduce the rest of the panel. And this will be followed by a brief reading by Stefano. And afterwards, our commentators will present their thoughts on the book, coming at it from their particular disciplines. We will then give Dr. Evangelista the chance to respond uh, to some of the points raised before entering into what promises to be a fascinating discussion. And then the event will conclude with questions from you, the audience. Um, so I will encourage everyone, if you have any questions throughout the talk, to please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It's really a great pleasure to be here to introduce the second book at lunchtime of the term. Book at Lunchtime is Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. And so please do take a look at our website so you can see what's coming up um, later on this term. So now all that's left for me to do is to thank you all for coming and to introduce our chair. Fiona McIntosh is professor of classical reception at Oxford and a fellow of St. Hilda's College. Her research focuses um, on the classical and modern reception of Greek and Roman drama. Professor McIntosh's most recent publication, written with Dr. Justine McConnell, is Performing Epic or Telling Tales, a volume exploring the turn of narrative in 21st century theater. She is a director of the Archive of Performances of Greek and Roman Drama. So I will now let Fiona start the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And thank you, Torch, uh, for the introduction uh, to chair this really very exciting session. Uh, my role uh, in the first instance, as Maria indicated, is to introduce uh, uh, my panelists, one of whom um, is obviously and an, an the much um, uh, anticipated author, Stefano Evangelista. And Stefano is Associate Professor of English and a Tutorial Fellow at Trinity College in Oxford. His work as many people will know, um, explores the links between English literature and other languages, classical antiquity, visual culture, and the history of sexuality. The book we're going to hear about today, Literary, Cosmopolitan, uh, literary Cosmopolitanism in the English fin de siècle, draws on research conducted during an AHRC fellowship in 2014 to 16, and a British Academy mid-career fellowship 2018 to 19. His recent Torch Knowledge Exchange Fellowship on, in, uh, on Berlin through the eyes of English writers resulted in an exhibition called Happy in Berlin, question um, mark. And that exhibition was held at the Literaturhaus in Berlin and Humboldt University, um, and also here in Oxford at the Bodleian Library. My fellow respondent today is Professor Anita Traninger. She's Professor of Romance Languages at Freie Universität in Berlin, and she's currently a visiting fellow at All Souls um, in Oxford. Her areas of research include the history of rhetoric and dialectics, transcultural engagements of literature and discourses of knowledge from the late Middle Ages to the 19th century. 
And she's also um, very much engaged with theories of gender and institutions, as well as media history. She's previously been a fellow in residence in the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, uh, a visiting scholar here in Oxford at Oriel College, and a global humanities senior fellow at Harvard uh, University. And what we're going to do first is we're going to uh, invite Stefano uh, to read um, a, a short passage um, from his, his, his new book. And then um, both Anita and I will offer our, our response to the book. So over to you, um, Stefano. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, for this lovely introduction, and thank you very much to uh, to Torch for hosting uh, this event. I'm really flattered uh, to be here, to be back after my uh, after my tenure as um, as Knowledge Exchange Fellow last year. Uh, thanks especially to Maria and to Maya for all the work um, um, for, for organizing um, uh, today's discussion. So uh, as Fiona says, um, I'm just gonna give you a, a brief reading from the book. It was difficult to decide what to read, but eventually I settled on a bit from the introduction. In fact, on the very uh, beginning uh, of the book, which I think lays out some of the questions and some of the um, ideas around cosmopolitanism that the book um, kind of engages ages with. And then I hope that in the discussion we'll be able to go into more, um, you know, more kind of, uh, as it were, stories that the book tells rather than its, its, its general theory as well. So here we go. Um, the introduction is entitled The Small World of the Fin de Siècle. What does it mean to live in a cosmopolitan age? In an essay from 1892, Walter Pater succinctly defined the late 19th century as, and I quote, sympathetic, eclectic, cosmopolitan, full of curiosity and abounding in the historic sense. It is impossible not to be struck by Pater's inclusion of cosmopolitanism alongside such keywords of Victorian liberal humanism as sympathy and curiosity. Pater, who was nearing the end of his career as one of Britain's foremost critics and stylists, had never used this word before in print. He now associated cosmopolitanism with habits of discrimination and comparison that characterized good criticism. It denoted the type of intellectual distinction that combined power of observation with the capacity to situate one's point, one's point of view always in a longer historical perspective and in relation to the wider world. In Pater's specific context, this meant looking beyond and maybe against the grain of English culture for new ideas and outlooks, which explains the link to eclecticism and later in the same essay to what he calls the act of removing prejudice. Given how notoriously painstaking Pater was in his choice of words, his prominent reference to cosmopolitanism as an attribute of the genius of the 19th century, as he says, should give us pause. Derived from the ancient Greek for world citizenship, cosmopolitanism asks individuals to imagine themselves as part of a community that reaches beyond the geographical, political, and linguistic boundaries of the nation. For the Greek cynic philosopher Diogenes, who is credited as having coined the term, cosmopolitanism was a category of resistance and non-belonging. When asked where he came from, Diogenes memorably retorted that he was a citizen of the world, implying that his outlook and loyalties would not be bound by the limits of the polis or state. Closer to Peter's time, Immanuel Kant posited the desirability of what he called the universal cosmopolitan existence that would enable people from all nations to join together in, again his words, a great federation, where the rights and security of all would be safeguarded. Kant, who also developed the idea of universal human rights, saw cosmopolitanism as a great political and ethical project, integral to the realization of the civilizing mission of the Enlightenment. But while for Kant cosmopolitanism was a utopian vision, or at best a feeling that is beginning to stir, again his words, for Peter, it was part of the material and historical reality of the present. Crucially, it was also intimately associated with literature. It is significant that Peter's remarks occur in the introduction to a new translation of Dante, 
the concept of cosmopolitanism enables Peter to explain the universal appeal of Dante, that is the qualities that make his work readily intelligible and attractive to different ages and nations, even through the distancing medium of translation. Peter's attempt to reclaim cosmopolitanism was symptomatic of a period in which this concept came under increasing pressure from writers. Some three decades earlier, Charles Baudelaire, whose writings were foundational for Peter and his English contemporaries, had lay, laid out the cosmopolitan tendencies of artistic modernity in his landmark essay, The Painter of Modern Life, published in 1863. Baudelaire defined cosmopolitanism as the ability to inhabit multiple points of view, what he called, I quote, being of the entire world. And at the same time, the desire to, quote again, to know, to understand and appreciate everything that happens on the surface of the globe. This clearly impossible ambition was the product of a world where advances in transport, media and communication technologies compressed geographical space and accelerated the international circulation of ideas. In this new small world of the later 19th century, especially as viewed from, from Baudelaire's vantage point, point in metropolitan Paris, individuals were more intellectually mobile than ever before and crucially readier to appreciate what came from different parts of the globe. As a consequence, cosmopolitanism also meant a heightened state of receptivity towards impressions and sensual stimuli. The dialogue between Peter and Baudelaire brings to light two key ideas that this book sets out to explore. The first is that in the years around the turn of the century, literature became an important medium for, sorry, for simultaneously promoting and interrogating cosmopolitanism, a topic that had previously been largely confined to philosophical discussion. In the literature of the fin de siècle, cosmopolitanism took shape not as an abstract ideal, but as something that informed the actual living practices of authors and readers as they experimented with new ways of relating local and global identities. The second is that cosmopolitanism was then, as it is now, a contested concept that generated debate and disagreement. Peter and Baudelaire both embraced the cosmopolitan ideal, but their intervention, interventions occurred within a largely hostile culture that denounced cosmopolitanism as politically and morally suspect and stressed instead the responsibilities of literature towards the nation. My subtitle, Citizens of Nowhere, emphasizes this sense of controversy by adopting a distortion of Diogenes' formula, I am a citizen of the world, that has been repeatedly used to stifle cosmopolitan uh, sentiment and to fuel nationalism. Baudelaire himself hinted at this discourse of alienation and non-belonging when he characterized cosmopolitanism as the ability to simultaneously be away from home and yet to feel oneself everywhere at home. Baudelaire viewed this condition in a positive light as a strategy of radical defamiliarization that presented attractive advantages in the artistic and social spheres. However, the same attitude that potentially enables the cosmopolitan subject to belong in different spaces and contexts places him or her at risk of becoming a stranger everywhere. That is of weakening the social, linguistic and affective ties that make individuals at home in a community. In the fin de siècle, this paradoxical nature of cosmopolitanism started to emerge clearly. It was simultaneously a position of strength and vulnerability a generalized condition of modernity and the form of, of exceptionalism that set some individuals apart from the rest of society. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano, for that um, riveting uh, reading, which um, you will not know, many of you, actually comes from the first two pages um, of Stefano's book. And I think already um, you will have realized just not only how illuminating um, this book is, but also how timely it is. Um, thinking about the tensions as Stefano has articulated them round about 1900 between cosmopolitanism and burgeoning nationalism. Um, those tensions of course are still with us and indeed still increasingly felt today.
This is an illuminating study uh, because it allow, allows us to reevaluate um, and also, I think, potentially decouple uh, the term cosmopolitanism from its Western, its also distinctly European roots. And I think, I mean, that might seem a paradox because this is a brilliant study of a moment that is deeply rooted in the first instance in Europe. But we're now at a moment when perhaps more than ever, um, as Stefano um, outlines um, as well, uh, it, it, particularly in his conclusion, when the concept of cosmopolitanism is considered very often mistakenly as the book points out, to be linked to naive uh, and indeed untenable questions of universalism, and therefore perhaps seen as eminently dismissible because it's essentially Western, white and exclusive. But the book reminds us otherwise. Yes, it's linked to Kantian universal human rights right from the beginning of the 19th century, but it's not in any way naively universal. Um, there are sp specificities uh, there right from the beginning. Um, in many ways, uh, and again, the introduction um, outlines um, very, very carefully and very clearly that right from the beginning, there are commentators on uh, cosmopolitanism who emphasize the need for these specificities, the need, if you like, for the local and the global, the global as uh, post-colonial uh, specialists would call it. I think the most important uh, other takeaway from, from, from the introduction especially is the complexities around cosmopolitanism at this time, the complexities and the nuances. For example, as we well know today, devotees of empire, particularly the British empire, don't necessarily in any way share any cosmopolitan values. And indeed um, their parochialism is much in evidence uh, in, in aspects of this book. Um, and of course, much more uh, terrifyingly in, in another um, context in the beginning of the 20th century and mid 20th century in particular, many of these devotees of cosmopolitanism ended up embracing um, uh, far right ideologies, fascism and Nazism in particular. So this is a nuanced study of a concept that I really do believe um, along with Stefano, needs to be recuperated. So it's a book about the birth of modern literary cosmopolitanism. Um, and, and modern is important because as Stefano's already done, he invokes Diogenes. Um, the, the birth of the cosmopolitan city may well have begun and often considered to have begun in Alexandria. Um, but it's the time too, as, as we've also heard, of the birth of comparative literature. It's also, um, if, if, if slightly earlier, the time of all kinds of comparatism, comparative philology. Um, we, we, we encounter um, Max Muller on, on the way here, the, the father of comparative philology, uh, comparative mythologies, and um, almost contemporaneous with, with, with discussions about comparative um, literature, comparative anthropology. For me, one of the figures who's been recovered um, is H.M. Posnet, um, the classicist who uh, is identified here as, as, as one of the chief exponents and founders of, of comparative literature. But there are a number of other cast members, and in many ways, they're a motley crew in this book, and that's really the strength of the book. We've heard already about Pater, I've mentioned Max Muller, and um, the center of this book, we have also already heard, is Oscar Wilde. And I think Stefano, those of you who know his earlier study, know that if anyone has put Walter Pater on the map, and if anyone, um, uh, the first port of call for someone to really understand Oscar Wilde, um, Stefano is the person to go to. So alongside these perhaps better known figures, Muller, Pater 
and of course Wilde himself, um, we have lesser known characters and, and I, I much admire the way uh, Stefano in his previous books as well has, has, has brought often marginal figures into view. Last time it was Michael Field and perhaps uh, rather better known Vernon Lee. But here, um, and I think we're going to hear more from um, Anita about at least one of these figures, we have, have Lefcadio Hearn, someone who's new to me, and George Egerton. Um, in some ways, we may think we don't know these characters, um, and I definitely didn't know much about George Egerton, but then I discovered I did know perhaps the most famous uh, cartoon of the new woman, the famous punch cartoon of Donna Quixote, and that figure of Donna Quixote is actually George Egerton. All these characters, um, as Stefano brilliantly um, uh, shows us, were in some ways out of time. They were, in that sense, um, uh, living, and some of them explicitly so, um, through their literature as, as a kind of creating on their way extraterritorial spaces. They were everywhere and nowhere citizens, as um, the subtitle of the book says. But I think, and Stefano brings out in, in many ways, they share something very important, and that is that they are all of Irish descent. And I think Ireland, as a bilingual culture to a large extent still today, and above all, a culture where sectarianism, especially with the rise of cultural nationalism at the end of the 19th century, despite efforts um, on the part of many members of the Protestant ascendancy to um, downplay sectarianism, well into the 20th century, and of course, throughout the 20th century, sectarianism um, makes belonging, rootedness, very complicated for, for, for many citizens. And I think in some ways lurking behind some of these characters are important narratives uh, relating to that. But I think, and I would add um, what may be of interest here is that comparatism gained especially important uh, currency and popularity in Ireland um, around this time towards the end of the 19th century. And that was because of the new discipline of Celtic st studies, that discipline that grew out of classics and comparative philology early in the 19th century. It becomes increasingly appropriated by cultural nationalism and, and cultural nationalists in particular um, in a, a, a program, of course, that tries to enable them and indeed in many ways succeeds in um, uh, privileging uh, the, the sort of Celtic um, heritage over what is increasingly um, uh, seen as um, not only oppressive, but the Philistine uh, British culture that has stifled its Celtic heritage and comparatism enables it to see links between the Celtic mythology and, and Greek mythology. But above all, it's a way, it becomes a way of seeing, I think, in Ireland from, from the end of the century into the 20th century, becomes a way of seeing beyond, of beyond the present, of enabling connections to be made, fleeting, parallel, but always, I think, suggestive, inspirational. This is a really refreshing book. Refreshing for me above all, as someone who works in classical reception, is that it does not confine itself in any way to the narrow uh, traditional disciplinary boundaries. It encompasses as well, very importantly, translator, translation, but of course also concedes all the time that the untranslatable is equally important. It deconstructs, as Stefano says, the, the dichotomy between the, the nation and the foreign, the here and, and there. Um, and it finds creative potential in their porosity. Um, its openness, 
and its tolerance. And I think, and I just want to stop now and draw attention again to these qualities that Stefano identifies at the heart of cosmopolitanism. The, the, the way it affords creativity, the way it encourages openness, and above all, the way it promotes and encourages tolerance. I think, and I'd like to say that all of these qualities are brilliantly embodied uh, in the author himself. Um, and I also think this is a timely book because we really need in these troubled times to celebrate and cherish these qualities that Stefano reminds us are at the heart of cosmopolitanism. I'm now going to hand over to Anita, who's going to give her response. My sound was off. All right. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you also, Stefano and Maria, for having me at this exciting event. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, there's such a wealth of perspectives discussed in this book, and it was really hard for me to choose what to focus on. But what struck me as particularly interesting was how Lefkadio Hearn, whose biography is certainly the most exceptional of all, and who is a rather marginal figure in European literary and cultural studies, emblematizes some of the intricacies of fantasiacal cosmopolitanism the book describes. Hearn, just uh, to, to give the, the briefest account of his life, was born on the Greek island of Lefkada, hence his name, uh, then grew, grew up in Ireland, emigrated to the United States and then on to Japan. He was a world traveler and in his biography, there are several dimensions of cosmopolitanism at work that are not easily reconciled. Taking him as a focal point, I'll concentrate on three aspects. First, I'll speak about the competing communities at work in this cosmopolitan landscape. And then I'll discuss the invention of literature in a transnational context before I'll turn to the imaginative side of cosmopolitanism. So cosmopolitanism, it seems, is informed by competing yet in intricately interconnected and interdependent communities. First, Cosmopolitanism is in itself informed by a paradox, and Stefano has already mentioned this uh, in his reading. It is on the one hand, a generalized condition of modernity, but it is at the same time, on the other hand, described as a form of exceptionalism that uh, sets some individuals apart uh, from the rest of society. Second, cosmopolitanism is in the 19th century set against the nation, which is the framework that all political strategy, economic effort, and most of the cultural and uh, literary production was geared towards in the West. It took, as Benjamin Anderson has shown, a lot of effort to naturalize the nation, relying on media technology to create and sustain the idea of nationhood. Cosmopolitans, on the other hand, styled themselves as a community of choice. Uh, but of course, this choice was available only to a very small global elite who had the means to travel the world and to move in these refined and exclusive cir circles. This freedom was, however, underwritten by global power structures. For Hearn, for example, it meant that coming from the Irish periphery, he still hugely profited from the social and economic networks of the British Empire. Against this backdrop, it is touching to see across all the case studies in the book, how these cosmopolitan figures craved to belong, not in their native countries, but in communities that were at times openly dismissive of attempts at mastering their culture and language, such as France, or had recently had opened up uh, to, uh, had only recently opened up to international communication and exchange, such as Japan. The cosmopolitanism of these rootless citizens of the world was underwritten by an ardent desire to belong, not at home, but elsewhere. For Hearn, his membership in the global cosmopolitan elite was an unwanted badge of honor. He abhorred the glamorous international scene which would set up camp wherever they pleased. He, on the contrary, much rather sought out places like Japan where he felt most foreign. Curiously, cosmopolitan Hearn did not want to see Japan transformed into a sort of cosmopolitan industrial republic, as he writes. So this is the fascinating thing that the book's, book makes abundantly clear, 
there is no simple dichotomy or opposition of national sentiment and cosmopolitan openness. Nation and cosmopolis are both formulations of imagined communities, which makes them no less real. And what is more, there are powerful tensions and contradictions at work that are not easily resolved. This leads me to my second point about the invention of literature. Lafcadio Hearn's interest in Japan was such that he went on to become not only an active agent in the production of the local, as, as Stefano Evangelista writes, he dedicated himself to preserving Japan's past as the country was undergoing rapid social, economic and cultural change brought about by the Meiji Restoration. Hearn yearned for a Japan that was deep disappearing before his eyes. It was old Japan that fired his imagination and it was about to vanish. What he longed for was thus a temporal community, letting him commune with a world that probably never was. It has often been remarked that Lefkadio Hearn made Japanese literature accessible to a Western reading public. He did indeed, but he did not have a command of Japanese that would have, uh, would have been sufficient to study and much less translate the Japanese classics. Uh, he in a sense created a Japanese literature for the West, which was then in turn accepted by the Japanese as part of their heritage. Much like Charles Perrault had done for France in the 17th century with his Histoire ou Conte du Temps Passé, the stories and tales from past times, and the Brothers Grimm for Germany with their Kinder und Hausmärchen, or fairy tales, in the 19th century, Hearn fashioned a national literary legacy out of supposed folk tales. He gathered them from secondhand accounts and manufactured tales from a vanishing world populated by ghosts, which of course he believed did not belong and had no place in modernity. Stefano Evangelista brilliantly describes Hearn's project as, and I quote, an archeological fantasy, which transports the reader simultaneously into the remote past and projects a future in which Japan, with its art and immemorial customs, will have been obliterated by the forces of modernization coming from the West. Hearn, the cosmopolitan malgré lui, uh, this created not only a Japanese identity for himself by adopting a Japanese name, Koizumi Yakumo, but he also invented a Japanese literature that at the same time opened up a channel for communication with the West. This inventive and imaginative dimension of cosmopolitanism leads me to the last part of my short remarks. Von der Siegel cosmopolitanism was, as this book admirably shows, an exquisitely complex matter. Nothing is natural. Everything is the product of negotiations of identity and belonging. An article on a history and the construction of identity by historian Joan W. Scott comes to mind where she offers an approach to the critical investigation of movements built on collective identities, which after all, despite its connotations of exclusivity, elitism and individuality, cosmopolitanism is. The title of Scott's essay is Fantasy Echo, which she admits is not a technical term. In origin, she writes, it was a mistake, uh, the result of a student's inability to understand some French words spoken in heavily accented English by a German-born professor of history. The professor referred to the last decades of the 19th century as fin de siècle, fantasy echo being what the student jotted down in their notes. I would suggest that this transcultural homophone of fin de siècle, fantasy echo, is more than a pun in our context. It is quite fitting for the constellations discussed in the book and Stefano Evangelista achieves both telling the story of fantasiacal cosmopolitanism and pointing us to the fantasies that informed the works of some of its most outstanding protagonists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita, very much. And I, I understand now that we invite Stefano to, to respond to us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for really um, 
wonderful responses, wonderful readings of, of, of the book, really. They've also kind of opened it up for me, really, to, to, to make me see things that perhaps were not so clear. Thank you for your generosity uh, as well in, in what, you, in what um, you've both been saying. So um, I've um, here in front of me two uh, large uh, uh, sheets of paper full of notes from uh, from your talks obviously i won't be able to address all the things that um, that, um, that, um, that 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 you mentioned all the questions that you've raised but i'll just uh, pick up on a, a few bits and pieces perhaps first of all and then we can uh, we can see we can, we can see how we, where we go as it were in discussion so to start with uh, uh, some of the points that fiona was uh, uh, making um, um, uh, first of all maybe um, the, the last point first as it were the point about i Island that you that you mentioned. I, I should um, say um, for the people who, who haven't seen the book that it has five chapters and three of them are, are based on authors and two of them are based on networks. And the three main authors of the book are Oscar Wilde, Lafcadio Hearn that Anita has been telling us about, and George Edgerton that um, that um, uh, um, Fiona was was mentioning earlier. Uh, and the, the two chapters on networks are on uh, periodicals and on artificial languages. Now the main three authors of, of the book. Um, all happen to be Irish, right? You know, and this is something that wasn't set out at the beginning. It's something actually that I realized uh, at some point as, it were, as I was writing the book, and I then had to find a way to 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 think about that and to think about the importance of Ireland. Uh, what's I think what, what uh, you know? Obviously, there is the position. That, the, the, there are the questions that Fiona was talking about about um, uh, the the moment of the of the so-called uh, revival of, uh, of, uh, of of Celtic culture, etc. Towards the 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 fin de siècle which has injected a new confidence about uh, um, uh, about kind of uh, uh, the, the 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 specificity of of of, um, of Irish culture and its relationship to, to 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 British culture. So the kind of sense of of marginality and centrality of Ireland is one of the things that um, on, on a global scale, right, that interested me vis-a-vis -vis, you know the the kind of uh, the, the 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 network as it were of of the of the, of the British Empire. Um, but what is also interesting is that all these authors had a very complicated relationship to their Irishness, right? You know, uh, uh, the all, all three of them did not live in Ireland uh, um, because of very self-conscious choices. And all of all three of them articulate their distancing towards Irish identity uh, on the one hand, and at the same time, they use their Irish identity to distance themselves from their British identity. So what fascinated me was precisely the way that the 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 kind of the, the yeah the, the marginality of Ireland is turned into a, a a strength, right? By by these three by these three authors and also the the, the complex relationship that um, uh, that uh, Irishness and nationalism have in in the context of this last the circle is something that uh, that interested um, that interested them I should say also there is there are kind of I, 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 a lot of other authors that I talk about in the book one of them briefly is somebody called HM Posnet uh, somebody who uh, whose name is probably not familiar to many people today but he has a kind of a, a small but sure a place in history for being the person who brought the concept of comparative literature into English for having first been the first to publish a book with that title. I think it was 1886, so Bang in this period, uh, comparative literature. Now, he was also Irish. And uh, what is interesting in, in one of the many things that are interesting in, in Postnet is the fact that he thinks about the relationship between imperial identity and cosmopolitan identity when he sets up the concept of comparative literature to uh, English readers. So he's writing from a point of view, but at the same time, he's thinking about empire as a cosmopolitan formation. And he's thinking of the British Empire as a cosmopolitan space. And as a pay and using that um, uh, the cosmopolitan makeup of the British Empire as the ideal ground for the development of comparative literature. Now, Obviously, that to us um, uh, um, immediately communicates, you know, problematic uh, positions, right, about about the, the privilege of the imperial subject. But again, it, it's it's one of these episodes that I think, um, kind of, to me, uh, uh, were emblematic in trying to conceptualize that con con that. Um, complexity of cosmopolitanism as a progressive and enabling discourse, but at the same time as something that could rely on imperial rhetoric and on uh, positions of yeah, privilege, right? You know, one, one of the things that the book is trying to, to do is interrogate 
the idea of privilege that's attached to the concept of cosmopolitanism uh, to us as 21st century readers, and also to see in what ways that privilege can be kind of scrubbed away, as it were, from this concept if we try to historicize in the late 19th century. And so uh, out of this also, um, 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 one of the, um, the, the the rich, as it were, fields that opened up for me when I was thinking of that was the whole idea of the social construction of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism as a sort so of social performance, the kind of thing that you see in the novels of Henry James or Edith Wharton, et cetera, from this period. That's also a very, very historically specific phenomenon of the fin de siècle, but it's something that authors already then are starting to investigate and therefore try to think about the way that world citizenship cosmopolitanism could be linked to strategies of performance, et cetera. So that's uh, uh, to address uh, some of the questions that Fiona was, uh, um, um, uh, was talking about. Um, to turn to Anita's uh, um, uh, response then, uh, I'm uh, uh, very uh, happy that uh, you've uh, uh, decided to concentrate it on uh, or, or focus it around the figure of Lafcadio Hearn. So Hearn uh, was, um, again, as I was writing this book, uh, I felt was my biggest, in a way, discovery and the, the, the author that became for me kind of really emblematic of the, the kind of things that I was um, doing. I set up Hearn in contrast to Oscar Wilde in the book and draw a parallel between them as representing two very different ideas of what being a cosmopolitan writer is and what cosmopolitanism means in the present. Both of them uh, use this word very sparingly, but they do use the, the idea explicitly in, in their works. And Wilde is especially, Wilde obviously was incredibly well read, a very kind of uh, intertextual, very elusive author and, uh, and, 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 and very conversant also, both with the classical and with the philosophical tradition. So he's kind of very much um, drawing on, on, on those traditions in his writing, whereas Hearn is somebody who, um, who is a, a kind of really an embodied, as it were, world traveler. He's somebody who's all over the place, right? Yeah. You know, as, uh, as Anita says, you know, he uh, goes to, um, um, to America, then he goes to Japan, he becomes a Japanese citizen, you know, incredibly rare thing, right? You know, for, for, for a Western uh, uh, person at the time, for somebody to give up his British citizenship in order to become Japanese, this means he has to give up his name, even he has to adopt a Japanese name, he his wife's name, etc. Interesting uh, kind of ideas about gender and authority and 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 ownership, as it were, of identity in in this as well. Um, uh, but Hearn is interesting to me as somebody who again embodies that idea of marginality and privilege very in, in very interesting ways. Hearn went to America as a migrant, like you know he really didn't have any money, right? You know, so he kind of started off. He kind of he, he, kind of, he, 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 be, he belongs to the narrative of migration, uh, um, to, to the, the enormous phenomenon of, of, of migration in the 19th century that uh, Joe McDonald has, re has recently published a wonderful book um, about. Um, but at the same time, it's undeniable that when he's in Japan, uh, he, he and, uh, and to a certain extent in America, he um, he certainly benefits from the cultural capital and the economic networks that the English empire uh, kind of uh, has prepared, as it were, for, for him, right? You know, so, that, so there is this kind of uh, 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 double bind. And another interesting uh, um, kind of uh, uh, paradox or clash that Hearns brought to light to me very vividly is the uh, one between cosmopolitanism and nationalism. This is in the period in Japanese history where there is a real upsurge of uh, a nationalist feeling, you know? So it, uh, uh, we have the, uh, the Russo-Japanese War and then the Sino-Japanese War, um, um, around the turn of the century. Uh, um, um, we are at the end of a process of opening to Japan, opening of Japan to foreigners that starts in the mid 19th century that kind of culminates towards the end of the 19th century reaction towards that cosmopolitan opening. And Hearn is somebody who embraces that sense of skepticism about the uh, model of cosmopolitanism that new Japan, industrial Japan, modern Japan has, uh, has, uh, has chosen for itself. So he's somebody who, in encourages even in his writing some nationalistic tendencies of, uh, of Japan, while at the same time being a kind of sworn enemy of nationalist feelings in general. So an interesting kind of a, a, a complicated uh, um, um, contradiction, contradiction there. Um, I could talk about questions of translatability, but maybe we, we leave that for the moment because that's kind of another big topic, maybe something that's very um, uh, closely linked to what we've been saying before, so far I should say, is the idea of self-fashioning, right? 
you know, we kind of touched upon it, I suppose, but um, um, uh, again, very strongly in Hearn, you know, kind of uh, fabricating a Japanese identity for himself, changing his name, kind of wearing Japanese clothes, so there's also certain uh, ability to manipulate the media image of himself to kind of to 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 to, to construct his his image as a kind of transitional, you could say, being a transitional citizen between cultures, etc. But yes, cosmopolitanism for me is uh, is is linked uh, or, 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 or for me or rather for for, for the literary uh, uh, um, world that that I'm kind of trying to talk about in this book is linked to yes the philosophical ideal uh, um, that that comes down from from the origins, etc. But it is also very much a, a way of um, of kind of creating an alternative identity, right? You know, a kind of uh, uh, it's linked to ideas of self-fashioning as they are uh, available to to the people at the time, the kind of media, the type of uh, discourses that they had then. And I should probably pause now and uh, um, kind of uh, hand back to Fiona and Anita. And Thank you very much. And I think at, at this point, we invite uh, Maria, our uh, super chair from Torch to, um, to, to come and uh, sort of chair, chair the questions proper. Yes, we've had a number of really great questions in the chat, um, Stefano, so um, here it goes. We have one question about how cosmopolitanism relates to the production of literature on that deals with the condition of a specific country, let's say France, mm -hmm. England, or Japan. Um, and, and that is really interesting. I mean, it, it reminds me of a lot of the production of the, the Latin American cosmopolitans in this period that feel like they have a kind of overview of the world, um, not just their own, but, but elsewhere. So could you speak a bit about that? Yeah. So are you talking about, for example, literature about Japan in the period? Yeah, yeah exactly. About and the condition yeah. of those countries, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Of course, yes, there is there is an enormous interest in that, uh, both in um, kind of book production, but also in periodical production. And I think that's a really interesting uh, um, uh, phenomenon, right, that we see in these years. Uh, and it's very closely linked to the idea of world literature as well, which is kind of uh, something that, again, interested me in the book. So this consciousness of uh, um, kind of literature belonging not only to a national space, but to an international space. And therefore, this whole uh, um, uh, field opens up for curiosity, as they were, about foreign literatures, but also the problem of, of related Ability. Like, how do we, how do we, how do we think about those relationships, right? How do we think about, you know, kind of I'm back to a point that Fiona made up about the idea of comparison. What does it mean to compare? What does it mean to to view Japanese literature from Britain? What does it mean to look at French literature from Britain? What does it look mean to see French literature from a Brit, sorry, British literature from a French point of view? All these questions were um, questions that authors were and, and readers actually were alert to. I think at the time and in uh, in. Uh, um, the, in, in constructing this uh, awareness, this kind of global identity as a reader, you, you could say, uh, periodicals played an incredibly important part. You have, I think, from earlier in the 19th century, in a way, specialized periodicals that's, that start to, um, 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 to, to carve out a field for themselves in writing about uh, uh, foreign cultures, right? So uh, uh, um, the um, um, interest in foreign matters, in foreign culture, etc., becomes in itself a, a specialism of sorts, right? You, you, uh, uh, and there is also, so you can become as well a specialized cosmopolitan reader with the paradox that this uh, obviously impossible uh, task kind of carries with it. And uh, um, one of the um, kind of related context that I explore in the book that I think is fascinating was the birth of the uh, first English Goethe Society, which again happened in the 1880s, just by chance, the same year as Postnet's uh, uh, book on comparative literature, which is a society that is there to publicize the, world, the works of Goethe, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also very much a society that is there to promote the idea of world literature. So of becoming a kind of wide reader, but also a reader that thinks about their relativity to other cultures when, when they read. Thank you so much. We have another question in the q and I, um, I do uh, ask people if you want, I'm, I'm looking at the chat as well. So we have two boxes where we are putting the questions. Um, and the question is about the figure's Irishness. Um, how would you characterize their interactions with um, and their responses to Irish language and uh, the way that complicates the nationalist cosmopolitan tension? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. 
Uh, so uh, of the three main people that uh, I deal with, so Oscar Wilde, Lacadio Hearn, and George Edgerton, I think that none of them actually um, um, kind of was involved in the Irish language movement. I don't think that any of them were, were Irish speakers at all. Uh, interestingly, they were all uh, kind of good linguists, you know, of sorts. I would say in all these cases, their first a uh, port of call in terms of foreign language was French. They were all excellent uh, um, French speakers. Um, Edgerton was also a speaker of Scan the Scandinavian language of Norwegian, and that kind of she carved a specialism for herself in that way. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't think they engaged with uh, with uh, with um, with Irish as a language. No, but certainly they had a complex relationship towards English. So, for example, again, you know, I can kind of draw two very brief examples to 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 show that kind of complex triangulation that Ireland and the Irish identity achieves them to. To, to perform. Uh, George Edgerton, uh, when she's kind of a, a correspondent to Scandinavian writers, I'm thinking about a, a writer called Ola Hansson in particular, who was a kind of major um, Swedish uh, decadent writer, and one of these uh, characters that, again, Fiona was talking about, that kind of swing to the right, as it were, um, cosmopolitan, but kind of also identified with the political right. Um, she um, uh, she talks of herself as a, um, as a um, kind of a belonging to the Irish cultural renaissance, right? Not, not a position that she would be uh, happy to inhabit within the British context, but something that she can use in an international context. And Wilde does a very similar thing. He talks about himself as Irish in Paris, and he loves to correct the French when they think of him as an example, as embodying uh, England, as a kind of a quintessential Englishman, something that Wilde tends to be read as uh, from the French point of view. He's always very clear about making a distinction between Britain and Ireland. Thank you so much. Another question. Um, how much do the different figures that you have encountered in the project overtly discuss biographical background? And you just spoke about um, Wilde and his Irishness. Um, but also the biographical accident as a factor in one's personal attitude towards cosmopolitanism. And there's a second part of this question um, that you may be able to, is there a, an idea at the time that certain people are predisposed to embrace cosmopolitanism? because of their circumstances of their birth, their upbringing or their education. Yeah, so yeah, so that's, uh, 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 that's really important, isn't it? I mean, I um, found that the biographical angle was helpful uh, for myself for situating these uh, um, writers in space, right? You know, for trying to, to think about their own um, mobility, but also to think about their own networks. So as I was writing the book, I found myself doing a lot of, uh, especially kind of archival work to try and kind of find out the specifics as it were, of how these people moved in space, etc. cetera. Um, but yes, the biographical construction is very, very important, especially because these are all writers who are, these three writers at least that I'm talking about uh, now, uh, Hearn, um, Edgerton and Wilde, they're all writers who are very conscious of having multiple uh, readership. They're all writers who are conscious of being potentially read in translation, if not now at a different point, etc. They're all people who had correspondence with critics and with influential people in different cultures, often in different languages, etc. And that kind of uh, um, uh, kind of multiplied their um, uh, possibilities for, for, in a way, for writing their own narratives from different point of view when they were addressing different audiences, right? And that's why I think the, the biographical becomes very important for them because they uh, realize that it is a very pliable uh, ground, you know, that it's, uh, that it's incredibly, um, incredibly uh, uh, easy to, to rewrite. Thank you, Stefano. Another question is, could you say a little more about the relationship between cosmopolitanism and Victorian liberalism? Um, wow, what that is cosmopolitanism individualist or is it collectorist? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you very much. It's it's, it's a huge question. Uh, yes, so um, maybe uh, a, a possible way of doing this would be to go back to the Peter quotes that I started reading with. You know, the idea of of cosmopolitanism linked to eclecticism, linked to curiosity. You know, kind of this kind of especially the idea of curiosity, the idea of criticism as well, right? You know, the idea of of, of of, um, of detached 
um, uh, um, uh, detached view on something, a critical view on something. These are all um, incredibly important parts of what um, Victorian liberalism constitutes. So in a way, cosmopolitanism is very um, easy to assimilate to, 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 to those values, right? But at the same time, cosmopolitanism is also or can also be seen as a discourse of exceptionalism, of extreme exceptionalism, that is in tension with uh, a, a liberal ideology. Um, and uh, with uh, this liberal ideology's own uh, uh, favored um, kind of modes of literary representation, such as, for example, the realist novel. And here I can um, mention maybe Vernon Lee, again, a, a writer who was uh, um, who was mentioned uh, uh, before in our conversation, a writer who uh, biographically herself had that kind of um, cosmopolitan pedigree, as it were, uh, more than anyone, you know, multilingual, kind of uh, um, international in the way that she was uh, brought up, uh, um, um, kind of incredibly uh, well connected in terms of, uh, of her uh, kind of intellectual and, and kind of uh, um, networks, etc. But somebody who was very quick to uh, denounce uh, or to use cosmopolitanism as a word to denounce a kind of superficiality, a kind of lack of engagement, lack of social engagement, lack of sympathy, right, that were at the heart of the liberal project. So for her, the idea of the cosmopolitan was in tension with the liberal because it didn't, it, it, because of its, its rejection of, of kind of, of deep roots, as it were, deep roots in a community kind of connection in that way. Yeah, this is we just one way of answering a huge question, obviously. Yeah. We have a little bit of time left and, and a lot of questions. I'm, um, so I'm trying to get through. What about race and Orientalism and its connections to cosmopolitanism? Um, yeah. Be, uh, the, the person asking is saying it seems like that should be a central category of analysis. Um, so um, can you say a bit about, about that, those dynamics, Stefano? Yeah, absolutely. So that's another incredibly important point. So that's something, for example, well, cosmopolitanism. So you can say that in the Enlightenment tradition that Kant represents, the, the Enlightenment universalism of Kant does, does not want to engage with the question of race because it, it because universalism presupposes an equality that kind of goes beyond all the kind of subcategories, as it were. At the same time, the embodied type of cosmopolitanism that I'm interested in and that these writers kind of uh, think about that is very kind of uh, to do with kind of how one perceives one's presence in the world, then for that type of cosmopolitanism, race becomes a, 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 a something that they have to deal with, something that they have to use in order to understand both the advantages and disadvantages, as it were, of the cosmopolitan position. So again, for example, in, in this book, I um, uh, uh, Hearn is somebody who opened up those doors very um, kind of more than anybody for me because he was in New Orleans when he was in America, and he became incredibly interested in the type of diversity the racial ethnic diversity of uh, of cosmopolitan New Orleans and um, and 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 wrote about that and wrote about uh, ideas of um, of um, of um, of kind of uh, uh, dialogue between cultures but also of uh, of marginalizations of uh, of racialized subjects etc um this similar thing but obviously kind of in a very different context when he's in Japan is is kind of very very um alert to that i should also say that the term race at this point tends to also be often allied with nationality as well, so that, for example, why can talk about his being not being English because he is Irish by race, for example. So there are interesting and kind of very complicated ways in which, uh, just like cosmopolitanism, the idea of race itself is obviously kind of uh, 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 fluid at this stage. So it, it pains me to say that we have reached the end of this wonderful book at lunchtime, and there are questions on gender, questions on um, on how they relate to the external world. So I would just back in to everyone, just please go and get Stefano's book because these these are all subjects that are covered throughout its pages. So um, this leaves me uh, uh, to say thank you, Stefano, for writing this magnificent tome uh, that I value very much personally. Um, thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Anita, for your brilliant uh, responses, your discussion. And thank you, audience members, for joining this really, really wonderful and illuminating book at lunchtime. I hope to see you again very soon and join us for the next one. Thank you.